talk about making room, and I get that title from a wonderful book by uh, Christine Pohl, who teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary. It's the best book I've ever read on, uh, on hospitality, and it's called Making Room, uh, re, uh, what was the, the, the word that she uses, uh, Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition. And then I like that idea of making room. As, uh, as believers, we're called to, to make room for the stranger, for the sojourner, the person who wanders into our lives. And I want to talk a little bit tonight about intellectual hospitality. What does it, make, what does it mean to make room for ideas that we disagree with? Uh, we've already heard some wonderful recommendations along those lines. It's so important for us to be uh, not demonizing uh, ideas that we disagree with. You know, G.K. Chesterton once said that uh, idolatry means not only worshiping false gods, but it also means uh, setting up false demons. And the demonization of other human beings whom we disagree with and the ideas that they present to us uh, can be the occasion for uh, for intellectual hospitality, making room, hosting ideas with whom we disagree. And uh, one of my favorite uh, comments along these lines uh, comes from, uh, that's the book, G.K. Chesterton quote, but uh, from Simone Way, who, uh, uh, one of my heroines in, in the faith, and uh, this great quote that I've used in a book recently and some other things that I've written, uh, a really helpful uh, comment, an inspiring one, that Christ likes us to prefer truth to him, she says, because before being Christ, he is truth. If one turns aside from him to go toward the truth, one will not go very far before falling into his arms. I, I love that. But a number of people have written to me recently when they read my book, and they said, that's kind of a dangerous thing, you know? I mean, do you really mean that we ought to follow any old idea that comes along, uh, hoping that Jesus is out there and is some gonna, somehow going to welcome us into his arms? And, and they're raising an important question. Uh, and this is why there's a, a second teacher that I have, indeed one of the best teachers I ever had, I was an English major as an undergraduate at uh, Houghton College in New York State. And I had a marvelous teacher, Dr. Josephine Rickard. We call her Doc, Doc Joe. And uh, in one of our seminars for English majors, we engaged in a heated discussion about the graphic portrayal of sexuality in fiction. And I argued uh, in a very brash way that we Christians should see fictional portrayals of the human condition as an opportunity better to understand the reality of sin. And Doc Joe just did not like what I was arguing. And she said, Mr. Mao, I can still that, that emphasis on Mr. Mr. Mao, we can have a perfectly adequate awareness of the reality of trash without having to go around lifting the lids of every trash can <laughs> in town. And that's true too. There's a kind of intellectual promiscuity that is a danger. But for many of us in the evangelical world, uh, we have erred more in, on the side of intellectual inhospitably inhospit or inhospitality uh, than we have uh, erred on the side of intellectual uh, promiscuity. And so I have three recommendations that I'd like you to consider tonight. They really follow up on some of the wonderful things that have already been said. Uh, because what Doc Joe was saying to me basically was the need for discernment. Um, and what Simone Weil is saying is that uh, the discerning life does need to keep a focus on the fact of Jesus Christ as the truth. All truth is God's truth. Uh, Arthur Holmes, the late Arthur Holmes of Wheaton College wrote, wrote a wonderful book with that title. And that we can't use the search for truth as an excuse to engage in making room for that which is soul destroying but we all do have to be open to the possibility that in the search for truth, strange ideas will actually enrich our souls. And so here's my first recommendation. Uh, don't let the salvific dominate all of your thinking about other perspectives. 
Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is the only way. So if you ask me, uh, you know, Buddhism offers a, a way of salvation that, that leads to a, a kind of eternal peace. Uh, is that a legitimate claim? I would say, I do not believe that Buddhism offers us a legitimate way of salvation. And if you ask me to put it bluntly, I will say I, I believe Buddhism is one of the false religions. But that's a very different thing than saying there's truth in Buddhism, <laughs> that we can learn from Buddhists. In fact, we can even learn from Buddhism some things that can enrich our spiritual lives. And so it's important. It isn't always easy, but it's important for us to keep a focus on Jesus Christ as, as the only Savior, the heaven-sent Savior, but at the same time uh, to be open to the possibility that the one who is the truth and who is, as it were, the origin and owner of all truth may, in fact, uh, lead us into truth. He may be standing there to greet us as we move in the direction of engaging some ideas from other ideologies and other religious perspectives. A second recommendation, uh, don't focus on your own best case against the worst case of others. I spent five years uh, uh, co-chairing with a Catholic bishop, the official Reformed Presbyterian and Catholic uh, dialogue, and we got into some heavy discussions about the Eucharist and about baptism and things of that sort. And, uh, you know, there were times that we both heard on, on, on this point. You know, you, you don't say John Calvin is a lot better in his theology than village Catholicism in, in, in rural Italy. And you don't say, on the other hand, that the great uh, uh, declarations of Vatican II have it all over uh, snake handling uh, Pentecostalism in, in, uh, in, in the Ozarks, for example. Uh, you don't put your best case against their worst case. If you're gonna think best cases, think best cases on both sides. If you're gonna think worst cases, think worst cases on both sides. And there's a lot for us to confess about our own uh, worst cases. And then thirdly, and I'm gonna spend a little more time on this one, uh, use engagement with the ideas of others as an opportunity for self-critique. Back in uh, 19, uh, early 1970s, John Stott, the great evangelical leader, had established a, an annual London lecture, lecture in contemporary Christianity. And this was a time, before some of you were born, but a time when there was a lot of liberation theology and a lot of dialogue between uh, certain kinds of Christian thinkers and Marxist thinkers, a kind of positive dialogue. And there were Christians who were saying, we have a lot to learn from from Marxism, and John Stott did a, a, a wonderful thing. He invited a, a, a very well-known liberation theologian uh, from Buenos Aires, uh, Jose Miguez Benino, invited him to London to give the lecture. And it was, it was produced in a, a, what, what I can still consider to be a, a marvelous book entitled uh, The uh, uh, Contemporary, uh, let's see, uh, Christians and Marxists, the mutual challenge, challenge to revolution. And uh, I used to use that book, that book as a textbook in uh, political thought. And uh, there was a wonderful line in there where, where Jose Miguez Bonina says, as Christians, we are not judged by Marx or Marxism. One alone is our judge, our, the Lord. But Marx is a witness. And he witnesses against us precisely at those points where we have received a very definite responsibility. Love, justice, abundant life for all human beings, the responsibility for creation in the world, the care of the poor. We must try to understand Marx's accusation. In that sense that Karl Marx is not our judge, but he has a right to spend some time on the witness stand. And people, other people with whom we disagree, people who are angry with us, as we heard in a very, very marvelous way from Christina, people who are angry with us out of their own sense of powerlessness, we need to allow them to take the witness stand. And even if they have a hard time articulating, we need to work at trying to understand what it is that motivates their angry accusations toward us. We have an obligation 
to understand their accusations. I find that very helpful uh, in my own life, in my own intellectual journey. Uh, we have a lot to learn from people with whom we disagree because of our sins against them. I was glad that Mike uh, mentioned something about uh, the gay, lesbian, or LGBTQ, et cetera, uh, community this evening because uh, as, a, as a conservative on these issues, I have to say, I also know that the Christian community has been inexcusably cruel uh, to people uh, who have experienced uh, attraction to people of, of the same sex. And, and, and part of what we need to do as people who are articulating our own, what we understand to be our biblically based position on that uh, is to confess our sins. And it's very important for us to, to um, allow them to take the witness stand against us and to hear what they have to say. I uh, have worked for a number of years with the Jewish community on a number of projects, and I was working on something on, for the American Jewish Committee on First Amendment issues, and uh, they sent a, a, a rabbi uh, to meet with me in my office, the president's office at Fuller Seminary. We had about an hour and a half together. It was a very fine, pleasant conversation. A week later, he wrote me a letter. And he said, I want to tell you how, how great it was for me to come out of your office feeling safe with a Christian. He said, I was raised in a rural Minnesota, a small town. We were the only Jewish family in town. And he said, when we went to synagogue in a, in a, a city uh, quite a bit far away, I, I was warned that I should not say the Lord's Prayer because in those days, in public schools in Minnesota, every morning the teacher, who was typically a Lutheran, would begin the day by saying, let us say the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to say. And he said, I was instructed that I wasn't to say the prayer as a Jew. And on the way home from school, kids threw stones at me and called me a Christ killer. And he said, I've got to say, when I was told I had to walk onto an evangelical Christian campus, as I got onto the campus of Fuller Seminary, I broke out in a cold sweat. And he said, I want to thank you for, after an hour and a half, uh, I came away feeling safe with a Christian. We need to hear. He had, he had a right, and I believe God sent him to sit in the witness stand and to testify about his experiences. There's so much more that we can say along those lines. And it's so important for us, and, and again, we just heard this from Laura, that we not begin, uh, even though a, a person in the case that she gave is a marvelous one, but we don't begin uh, with harsh critique of, of who people are and where they are. I've, I've learned so much from Acts 17, the Apostle Paul on this. You know, Paul was a, a Jew who had become a Christian, and what was common to both of those was a, a deep, a deep um, antipathy toward idolatry. And here he walks into Mars Hill, and he sees all these idolatrous altars, these altars to other, all kinds of gods. And, and Luke says, in, in, in describing Paul's inner feelings, uh, he says, and he was deeply disturbed by the idolatry that he saw. But when he had a chance to address those people, he did not begin by saying, here are a bunch of idolaters. But he said, hey, you're pretty religious people. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, and I've been reading some of your poets, and let me tell you a couple things that they say. And, and he engaged them on a kind of common ground although ultimately he did point them to Jesus. And there's a wonderful line later on in that chapter. It says, when they heard about Jesus and the resurrection of the dead, they scoffed. But some said, we want to talk to you more about this. I was on national public radio one time with, uh, I was pitted against a, a liberal Protestant theologian. And the whole question was, why does Jesus keep showing up on television shows and Time Magazine covers and Huffington Post. Why are people so, uh, so fascinated with Jesus? And the other guy went first and he said, well, you know, he obviously was a very commanding personality, so much so that when he died, his closest disciples had a hard time accepting that fact. So they created this whole myth about his being raised from the dead and he's still alive and, and all the rest. 
And then it was my turn. I said, well, he is still alive. I mean, one of the reasons why he continues to fascinate people is that he's there drawing people uh, to himself and that he's the fulfillment of our yearning as, as human beings. And the other guy said, oh, man, you don't really agree with, it. believe that kind of stuff. I mean, and I said, well, the apostle Paul said that if Christ isn't risen from the dead, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. Yeah, and he said, but Paul's wrong about this and he's that and the other thing. You know, he's wrong about a lot of stuff and he's wrong about this too. Then it went back and forth, and I was defending a physical resurrection, and he was denying the very reality of the resurrection. And then uh, they, they were calling. And when, you, when you're there in the studio, there's a screen, a computer screen, and there's a rabbi on the 210 who has a question about the Last Supper, and Irma from West Hollywood has a question about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Joshua from uh, Long Beach has a, a question about uh, what, what, it, what it means to be a disciple and all of this kind of stuff. And then there was Heather from Glendale, and she had a question about the resurrection. So Heather comes on, she's about 15 years old. And she said, like a lot, I'm sorry, some of you do that too, but she said, hi, I'm like Heather, and I'm from like uh, Glendale. And uh, I'm, I'm not a Christian or anything like that. In fact, I'm into witchcraft and stuff. But I gotta say, I'm shocked at the guy who says that Jesus wasn't risen from the dead. I agree with the president of Fuller Theological Seminary. Yeah. <laughs> well, you take what you can get uh, in those kinds of debates. But, <laughs> but I often think of Heather of Glendale in that wonderful verse in Acts 17 where it says, but some said, we'll talk to you more about this business of the resurrection. I wish I had a chance to welcome Heather into my intellectual space. I'd like to learn from her. I'd like to allow her to sit in the witness stand and to testify against me and, and my kind of people. And then I'd like to engage her in a conversation about what it means really to affirm that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And I'm sure that as I approached her, even as I approached reading Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and the postmodern thinkers and all the rest, as well as Jews and Mormons and Hindus and Buddhists, that I can't walk very far in the direction of seeking the truth without falling into the arms of Jesus. Thank you.